Thank you for joining us for LifePoint Online. We are glad that you're here with us today. We are Matt and Emily Didway, and we hope that you're staying happy and healthy in this new year. It's been great for us to get kicked off in 2021. It's been fantastic for our family to be here and, and be a part of LifePoint with you. Uh, six feet back, remember? <laughs> Honey, we don't have to be six feet. It's uh, We're married, six feet's not a thing for us. Yeah, but you worked out this morning, so. Honey, home gym, you know, you know what they've been saying, gotta work off that quarantine 21. It's quarantine 15. <laughs> Honey, I, I passed that a long time ago, so it's definitely gonna have to be at least 21 and 21, however you wanna call it, I gotta lose it. <laughs> Well, if you have any goals for 2021, drop them in the chat. Let us know what are your goals for this new year. And if you're here for the first time, that's awesome. We hope that your experience will inspire you to come worship with us again. I want to challenge you to try our Try Five. Set a weekly reminder, worship with us five weeks in a row, and see what happens when you regularly seek connection with God. We think that after five weeks, God will make a difference in your life, and you'll have a better idea about whether LifePoint is the church home for you. We have a welcome gift that we'd love to send you. Uh, just share your contact information with us on a Connect card. In fact, we hope that everyone will fill out a Connect card today. There are literally hundreds of people worshiping online with us each week, and we wanna know that you are here. You can also use the Connect card to ask questions you have or let us know how we can pray for you. You can access the Connects card in LifePoint's app, or you can text the word hello to 919-948-7400, and we'll send you the Connects card right to your phone. Each week, we take a moment to focus on generosity. While there's no way to match God's generosity to us, we follow his example by offering back a portion of what he has blessed us with. Thank you for giving. It helps move God's mission forward through the, his church. To make a gift today, text LP Church to 77977. To find out other ways that you can give, please visit lifepointchurch.com and click on the Give tab. Again, thanks for being part of LifePoint Online today. We hope that you have a great week.
Well, if you ask me to talk about how Cinda and I met, I could recall with great detail the friendship, the attraction, the first date, falling in love, the engagement, and finally, wedding day. Because it's an experience I've lived. Occasionally, somebody will ask me about the history of our church, which goes way back, even before the church began, when I began to feel this prompting from God that was leading me in a direction of church planting. And through the years since LifePoint began, there have been ups and downs and bumps in the road. And I remember stories of life change, of God moving and coming through for our church in big ways, days where I experienced doubt, growth, and victories that God had given us. Those stories are easy to share in great detail because I lived those experiences. You have experiences you can talk about too. And that's what today's message is about. Talking about our experiences with Jesus in a way that lets people know specifically how he's changed our lives. We've been in a series for several months called Classic Christianity. We just took a few Sundays off while we went through the Christmas and New Year season, but today we're gonna pick back up in Acts 21 and 22. For those of you who are new to our church or those of you giving church a try this year, let me give you a little bit of background as to where we've been. So I chose this series through the book of Acts because I wanted our church to look at the first church the first Christians, and consider how they lived and what they believed, and then allow that to influence our faith and our day-to-day -day lives. So let me do a quick review of what's happened. So after the resurrection of Jesus, he appeared to his disciples and gave them this direction in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Then it began. His disciples began to do exactly what he just said. And what follows in the book of Acts is people being empowered by the Holy Spirit to tell others about Jesus, to be his witnesses. They go to Jerusalem, like Jesus said, then Judea, then Samaria, and beyond. And all the while, they're giving us timeless, classic examples of how Christians should act when, when times are good, when times are challenging, when they're discouraging, disappointing, or even confusing. And today we're going to be looking at a section of Acts where we're 28 years from the time Jesus said those words that I just read. So open up your Bible or your app to Acts 21. We're in a section where we're following the journeys of the Apostle Paul and his companions as they preached the gospel, planted churches in every town they could. Paul has just left a group of church leaders we read about in chapter 20, and he told them that he knows he's never going to see them again, and we left them on the beach by the boat praying with him. So we're going to pick up on his travels and make some observations about what these first Christians did. So Paul leaves on a boat with his companions, and they travel to this city called Tyre to visit churches that had been planted there. Now let me put some pieces of the puzzle together for you. In Acts chapter 8, the church was being persecuted by the government. If you remember that section, the believers scattered and it says, but they preached the word of God wherever they went, meaning that they told the story of how Jesus had changed their lives as they went about their day-to-day -day lives. Tyre would have been one of the places that if it were not for the believers being scattered out of their comfort zone, that church may have never been there. What I can take from this is that if I never let myself get uncomfortable, if I never take risks and do what may not make sense, what won't happen? What if they had chosen not to speak up wherever they went and speak truth? We may not be reading this story. So ask yourself this question, what's not going to happen in my life for God if I never allow myself to get uncomfortable? Because comfort and growth cannot coexist. Well, so far we're 10 days into the new year and I'm doing what many of you are doing. I'm cutting back on sugar because it's my weakness. I can down a bag of M&Ms faster than anybody. And I lack the ability to walk past a piece of cake. Can you relate? I can tell you that if I'm going to make healthier choices this new year, I'm going to have to get uncomfortable. I'm going to have to practice discipline. And when it comes to your spiritual life, if you want to grow, if you want to get connected, if you want to stand up for truth, and you want to have an impact on the world around you, get ready to be uncomfortable. So let's pick up the story told by Luke as they meet up with the church and their leaders in the city of Tyre. 
It says in verse 4 of Acts 21, We sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city, and there on the beach we knelt to pray. Now, there's three big observations we're going to take today out of chapters 21 and 22. So we're combining two chapters, and I want you to remember these observations. So if you have a pen, type these in, write them down, because you're going to want to remember these. From the very beginning, families experienced church together. Based on what I just read, from the very beginning, families experienced church together. It's no accident that they mentioned wives and children went with the church leaders to see them off and pray with them. See, they were coming from a religious culture that saw women and children as second class. And here, from the very beginning, in the first generation of the church, families were experiencing this new faith in Jesus together. That's why many of you right now are gathered around the screen with your families watching together. Because you know the value of living out your faith as a family. That's why we push you as parents, not just to see us as ones who teach your kids about Jesus, but ones who partner with you, helping equip you to teach your kids how to follow Jesus in their lives. Think about this, parents, and even grandparents. The biggest impact you can have on the kingdom of God is the disciples you make in your own house. Those little ones that sometimes drive you crazy, yet bring you the most joy. We want to help you do that not just by what they experience from us, but by resourcing you to perform your greatest responsibility, and that is discipling your children. My kids range in age from a senior in high school to a 25-year-old who is married. And I still, though it looks different, send them books, blogs, podcasts, and scriptures to help them in their faith journey. If you're wondering, well, where do I start with my kids? I don't even know. There's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of stuff that's great, a lot of stuff you need to stay away from. I want to share some resources with you. So check out this morning's Facebook and Instagram posts for a list of great resources to help you disciple your family no matter what your family looks like. And also, if you describe to our weekly news email, uh, you'll get those this week when you receive that. But imagine that scene on the beach in Acts 21. Big hands, mom hands, little hands, joined together with Paul and the others, praying. Imagine the impact it would have had on those little ones. Do that with your families because the church from the very beginning has been impacting families. Let yours be one of them. So let's read on in verse 8. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the evangelist, one of seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Again, the writer of Luke I think intentionally mentions women here because of the culture they were coming from. In that culture, women were considered second class. And that brings us to the second observation in today's reading. One was that families experienced church together from the very beginning. And two is that they continued to let people know that the gospel was for everyone. We've already talked about how Paul took the good news of Christ to the non-Jews of the Gentiles. And now it's clear that women were also speaking words of God, and they were not second-class citizens. That would have been a new way of thinking for many people. Nothing else is said about these four ladies other than they were single, their dad was an evangelist, and they preached the word of God. As Paul continues to interact with the church in the small towns north of Jerusalem, they urged him not to go because they were afraid for his safety. But he was compelled by God, and he goes anyway. They knew that he would be arrested. But still, his dedication to doing what God had called him to do was greater than any personal risk he would experience. So let's read what happens as he arrives in Jerusalem, starting in verse 17 of chapter 21. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed 
and all of them are zealous for the law. They're seeing that this gospel for everyone is working. Gentiles are following Christ. Jews are following Christ. Even though they're still struggling with the legalism they'd grown up with that concerned the elders, they still had made a decision to follow Christ. And then they end up reminding Paul of what they had earlier told the Gentile believers in chapter 15 of Acts when they said this, As for the Gentile believers, we've written to them our decision that they should abstain from food, sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. The reason he brings this up again is because he was saying there are valuable rules or laws, and these are the ones we told the new believers who are Gentiles to keep. Now, the food and blood of strangled animals had to do with the worship of false gods and health. And the teaching about sexual immorality had to do with helping them see that the do-whatever-you-feel sexuality was not from God. And God's view of sex was the only correct and moral view. And anything outside of that was immoral. We did an entire sermon on this section of Scripture in Acts 15. So if you missed it, you can go back on our website, find the watch section, and find Acts 15 and hear us talk about that verse specifically. The gospel is for anyone doesn't mean that anyone can live however they deem appropriate. It means that anyone can come to God, receive forgiveness and eternal life, and it doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter what they're doing. God can change them. Anyone, no matter what. A teaching that excludes anyone is not the gospel of Christ. And in the same way, teaching that doesn't call on its listeners to lay down their lives and live the life Christ has for them is also not the gospel of Christ. And that brings us to the third observation from chapters 21 and 22. Let's jump back into the story at a point that Paul had been arrested in Jerusalem just like they'd feared. He was arrested for preaching about Jesus. Then they find out he's a former Jew, he's a Roman citizen, and they actually allow Paul, who had been arrested, to address the crowd who wants to kill him. Now, here's what we're going to find out. That the gospel in my life creates a story with my life. And that story is your story to tell. Paul is about to retell his story of coming to know Jesus. If you follow Jesus, you have a story. And the way Paul tells this is a great outline for us to learn how to tell our story because he tells his story in three sections. So write this down. He talks about his life before Christ, his life during the time he found Christ, and his life since he accepted Christ. So before, during, and since. Listen for that as I read through what Paul says to the people who wanted him killed. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way, meaning Christians, to their death arresting both men and women, throwing them into prison, as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Now that's Paul's section of my life before I found Christ. That's part of his story. Now that doesn't sound like a great resume for a traveling evangelist. But something happened. Just like in your life, before you found Christ, something happened. You were going in one direction, and like Paul, something changed. So let's read on. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Paul tells about the moment he first heard Jesus. And all of a sudden, he realized that what he was doing was wrong. What he had believed moments before, with all of his heart, was now in question when he meets Jesus. And if you follow Christ, you've had that moment too. I've had that moment. 
all of us who've said yes to Jesus should be able to recall the first time we heard, felt, experienced God waking us up. And that's what's happening to Paul here in this first time that he met Jesus. See, during this time, Paul was not just having an experience with Jesus, he was directed to people who could teach him. So he was directed to a godly man named Ananias, and here's what Ananias told him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on his name. See, before Jesus, Paul believed things that were wrong. He did things that were wrong. During the time he met Jesus, he needed a big wake-up call and an assignment from God to go and be a witness. Then he was baptized. And we've been reading about his life over the last several parts of this series since Paul started following Christ. Because after this episode, he learned more about Jesus. He started traveling and sharing the message of Christ, planting churches, walking into danger, all because he met Jesus, gave up his beliefs, surrendered his life to Christ and his will to God. The Apostle Paul ended up writing two-thirds of the New Testament that we read. Through the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we still can read those words of Paul today. Other than Jesus, no one had the impact on the church that the Apostle Paul did. And his story, it still inspires people today. Your story can inspire people too, but you have to tell it. You have to talk about before, during, and since. Is it really that simple to tell my story? Yes, it is. You might think, well, I don't have a story. If you know Jesus, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, you have a story. My wife used to say to me, my story is boring because I can't remember a time not knowing God and loving God and wanting to follow God. When we dated, I remember asking her things like, so you like never snuck out of your house, not once? She'd say, nope. Like, you never, like, sneaked a little drink to see what it was like? Nope. And you always came home when your parents said, and you did what you're supposed to do, and you listened to them. And she would say, yes. And inside, I can remember thinking, I'm going to marry this girl. Now, my story took a few more twists and turns because I did live far from God at one time in my life. But no matter what your story is, God can use it. If your story is, I grew up knowing God, owned my faith as a teenager, and have been walking with Jesus ever since. That's a powerful and great example. And those of us who don't have that story, we wish we did. Students, listen to me. Don't go out and do bad stuff just so you can have a story. Because all that bad stuff comes with regret. So steer clear of it. Whatever your story is, on either extreme, God can use it. But only if you tell it. So today I have two assignments for you. One is to find someone within this month, in the month of January, and tell them your story. Maybe you start with writing it out, and then you tell it. Your life before Christ, your life during the time you met Christ, and your life since you've been following Christ. You know, some of the greatest growth leaps I've taken in my faith was when I was sharing my story with somebody else. Because when you share your story, you make the message of Christ real to somebody else. They may or may not agree with it, but it's your story. It's your life change. It's your testimony that Jesus, in fact, does change lives. And just like in the ancient church, the responsibility of making disciples is given by Christ to those of us who are disciples. When you put your God story out there, he's going to use it in ways you could never imagine. Now, the second assignment is to pray. If you're in a room with your family or friends or even by yourself, as soon as I'm done, there's going to be a couple of minutes before communion when you can pray. So I want you to take that time and pray together. Pray the way they did with Paul at the beginning of this story. Big hands, little hands, old hands, young hands. Join hands in the living room or wherever you're watching and pray together. So we've observed three big things out of these two chapters of Acts. Families experiencing church together since the very beginning. Remembering that church is for everyone. 
And everyone who follows Christ has a story that can impact others. Let their story motivate you to take those steps to be a witness and a storyteller with what God has done in your life. Now, if you're in the chat with us live today, let us know if you want to start your God story. Maybe you're just checking out church and you haven't yet accepted Christ. We would love to walk you through that decision and help you create a story in your life because of the power of God working in your heart. If you need prayers or you want to go deeper with this message, just let us know and we're here to serve you. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this time where we can observe some amazing things in the first century church. God, it's so encouraging to see families involved in church from the very beginning. And God, it's inspiring to know that the message you have is for everyone and it excludes no one. God, help us to share our stories so we can help other people have stories of faith, of you changing their lives. God, help us lead well. Help us lead our families well. Help us lead those around us well. And help us be examples of what a changed life looks like in our world today. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. This is my favorite portion of our worship service. As great as it is to glorify God through our singing, and as amazing as it, is, as it is to hear God's word through our preaching, this is the moment that I appreciate the most to try to connect with God in my own spirit and soul. Through my Christian walk, I've had many ups and I've had many downs. There's been times in my life where I felt so guilty and, and full of just problems that I didn't think I could go to God. There's been some other times where I've tried so hard and, and I tried to volunteer more and meet with people more and do more and I could never quite add up. That's when a friend finally talked to me about how God's love is a perfect love. And in perfect love, you can't add to it, you can't take away. That means God loved me when I was down and God loved me when I was trying to do the most. And that's why when communion is about to happen, we take it in remembering who God is. So before we take the bread and before we drink the juice or whatever you have at home, just remember that God is perfect love. And I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer that says, God, search my heart, the good and the bad. I ask God to help me with what I know is right for my community, my family, and my church. 
But then I also ask God to help me in those areas that I know I've been struggling in this week and, and for really my whole life. I also ask for forgiveness when I know that I messed up and I know that God wants what's best for me. So let's take a second. Remember that God is perfect love and that he can search our heart for the good, the bad, and what we can ask for forgiveness with. God, we just thank you that you are willing to search our hearts and help us in this life with all the people around us. In Jesus' name. Then God took, his, took bread and he said, eat this bread and remember that this was my body that was broken for you. This is the part where I just say, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Let me see my neighbors, my family, and my friends in the same way you see them. And if I see something in this world that, that, that breaks your heart, let it break mine. So pray and ask God to break your heart for what breaks his, and then eat this bread in remembrance that God did that for us first. God, I pray for our community, I pray for our friends. I pray for our family and all those around us. God, let us see the hurt and people and how we can be a part of that. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who showed us first. Take and eat. Then Jesus took his wine and he said, drink this. Remember me that my blood was spilled out for you. See, I realize that some of us, sometimes I need to pray just as much that not only do I take it in, but I pour out who I am with the help of God with me through all of this. That when I see my neighbor who needs help, when I have to be extra patient and loving or show that much more grace to my family or friends, whoever it is, I remember that God's love was poured out for us first, that his son's blood was spilled for us to show us how much he loves us. So take and drink and remember that his blood spilled out for us first. Dear God, I pray for all the situations right now in our church family, all the family, friends, and things that are happening at work and in our community. God, let us just pour out our love with your help. We thank you that we can take this moment to remember who you are and that you are with us. Take and drink and remember that his blood was spilt for us. It's so good to connect with God. But for the rest of the week, we hope that you connect with each other over the internet or however you can in a social distance way. But go. Have a great week, and we hope to talk to you soon. Thanks.